Shalom, Alekum, peace be upon you, and welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found, scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives, and that's where you go to support this mission of truth. Today we are looking at this week's Torah portion. Uh, Shimini is the name of the portion, and it's actually a very interesting one. Uh, let me just give you the portion summary real quick, and then we'll start our conversation here. Shimini is the 26th reading from the Torah and the third reading from the book of Leviticus. The word Shimini means eighth, and it comes from the first word of Exodus 9, which says, Now it came about on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. The text goes on to describe the events of the eighth day after setting up the tabernacle. A phenomenal worship service followed by a tragic incident. The reading concludes with the biblical dietary laws regarding animals fit for consumption and prohibitions regarding those that are unfit. So what we have in today's story is finally the dedication of the Mishkan, right? The celebrate the tabernacle is up, it's the eighth day, it's, it's this time of great joy and celebration and you know spiritual experience and then it Aaron's two sons they get a little ambitious and they end up being struck dead by God and so it's a tragic story um, and we're gonna look at it we're gonna look at a couple of other things we're gonna look at some other examples that I think connect to this story to kind of paint a whole picture for us and I think you're going to be blessed and I think you're going to enjoy the reading this morning so we have chapter 9 that deals with the priesthood being inaugurated and then chapter 10 is when Nadab and Abihu Aaron's two sons make this critical error and then chapter 11 deals with the clean and unclean foods and unclean animals so that is what is on the agenda for this morning I pray that you will be blessed. I'm going to read from the Hallelujah Scriptures. I just really enjoy using it when we do our Torah portion studies. And uh, like always, I'll kind of translate any Hebrew words on the fly so that you understand what's going on. All right, with that said, let's begin. We'll read chapter 9, and then we're going to break down what's happening in chapter 10. Leviticus 9, verse 1. And on the eighth day, it came to be that Moshe called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Yisrael. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a young bull as a sin offering, and a ram as a burnt offering, a perfect one, and bring them before Jehovah. And speak to the children of Yisrael, saying, Take a male goat as a sin offering, and a calf and a lamb, both a year old, perfect ones as a burnt offering, and a bull and a ram as a peace offering to slaughter before Yehovah, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today Yehovah shall appear to you. And they took what Moshe commanded before the tent of appointment, and all the congregation drew near and stood before Yehovah. And Moshe said, This is the word which Yehovah commanded you to do, so that the esteem of Yehovah appears to you. And Moshe said to Aaron, Go to the altar and prepare your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people, and make the offering of the people, and make atonement for them as Jehovah has commanded. So Aaron came near to the altar and slaughtered the calf of the sin offering which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron brought the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood, and he put it on the horns of the altar, and poured the blood at the base of the altar. And the fat, and the kidneys, and the appendages, and, the, and of the liver, and the sin offering was burned on the altar, as Jehovah had commanded Moshe. And the flesh, and the skin he burned with fire outside the camp. And he slaughtered the burnt offering, and the sons of Aaron presented to him the blood which he sprinkled on the altar all around. And they presented the burnt offering to him with its pieces and head, and he burned them on the altar. 
And he washed the entrails and legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. And he brought the people's offering and took the goat, which was the sin offering for the people, and slaughtered it and made it a sin offering like the first one. And he brought the burnt offering and made it according to the right ruling. He also brought the grain offering and filled his hand with it. And he burned it on the altar beside the burnt offering of the morning. And he slaughtered the bull and the ram as peace offerings which were for the people. And Aaron's sons presented to him the blood which he sprinkled on the altar all around. And the fat from the bull and of the ram and the fat tail and the covering and the kidneys and the appendages on the liver. And they placed the fat on the breast, and he burned the fat on the altar. But the breast and the right thigh Aaron waved as a wave offering before Jehovah as Moshe had commanded. Aaron then lifted up his hand toward the people and barak them, that is to say blessed. And he came down from making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moshe and Aaron went into the tent of appointment, and it came out and Barak the people, and the esteem of Yahweh appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar, and all the people saw and cried aloud and fell on their faces. Please note. So that's chapter 9. So they've got all the offerings done and everything, and then the glory of the Lord appears, the esteem of Yahweh. The people actually can see this glory, this esteem. Interesting enough, I think the word there, you can go look this up if you have time, but I believe the word there in Hebrew is COVID. (laughs) Uh, But that's for another discussion. So the the glory of Yahweh appears to all the people, and when they see it, they fall on their faces. Now, this story should be bringing some things to memory. And if not, don't worry. We'll go dig into it here in a minute. Now, when we get to chapter 10, we get to the tragic incident. So we have this massive spiritual experience happening, right? They, they do what they're commanded to do. They've put all this work and they've been working on this for seven days, getting this thing ready. And now it's finally here. The celebration has started. The tabernacle is set up. The glory of the Lord is around. Then we get to chapter 10. And here's what it says. Verse 1. And Adab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his fire holder and put fire in it and put incense on it and brought strange fire before Jehovah, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from Yehovah and consumed them, and they died before Yehovah. And Moshe said to Aaron, This is what Yehovah spoke, saying, By those who come near me, let me be Kodesh, that is to say, holy. And before all the people, let me be esteemed. And Aaron was silent. And Moshe called to Mishael and to Alsaphan and the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the Kodesh place and out of the camp. And so they came near, and they took them by their long shirts out of the camp, as Moshe had said. Let's stop for a second. I've seen some really bad commentaries on this, um, bad Christian commentaries on it. Uh, where they try, where they try to be like, well, they must have brought in some like occultic fire, or they were, the sons of Aram were committed people before Jehovah. Okay, I believe they were good, righteous, godly people, and yet this still happened. We're going to compare it to a story real quick, found in this week's prophets portion, which I don't think is an accident. So we're going to go to 2 Samuel. The backdrop is, is David is trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Let's pick up the story. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Here's what it says. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and he went with all the people who were with him from Beljudah to bring up from there the ark of God, 
which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ehuo, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God. And Ehuo went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and with lyres and with harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nakan, Yuhuzaz, Yuzaz, or Uzzah, put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there before, beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And the place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of God into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Okay. So that's the story. Now, you might, in both of these situations, you're like, okay, these guys are just trying to do something for the Lord, and then God is just striking them dead. And we have two different kind of reactions. We have Aaron, who just keeps silent, which speaks to his faith and to his character, right? Like, wow, your sons were struck dead in the, in this moment that's supposed to be this great spiritual experience. You've done all this work for God. You've committed your life and your son's lives to this work, to this priesthood, and then God strikes your son's dead. But Aaron just keeps silent. David, on the other end, is actually angry. Right, And it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. So what's happening in both of these situations? There's some errors happening. This isn't out of ungodliness or, or you know, some mal malicious intent. But in both situations, they're trying to do something great for God, but they're in error about how they're going about it. For example, let's start with the Ark of the Covenant situation. This is really David's fault at the end of the day. They're bringing it in on a cart pulled by oxen. Well, what was the commandment on how to deal with that? You were to carry it using the poles on the sides, right? That was the commandment. So it's on the it's on the thing, and the ox stumbles, it starts to lean, Uzzah puts his hand up there to stabilize it, but the whole situation is against what God wanted, and how he wanted it done, and how he said to do it, and so he struck him dead, and the end result is that everybody was afraid, right? And David was afraid of the Lord that day. Why? Because God had demonstrated that, hey, when it comes to certain things that I have said, don't mess around. Right? You might say, but why? Why does it have to be that way? I mean, they meant good. You remember, you probably remember being a young child and your parents would say, don't do this, or no, you can't do that, or no, you have to do it this way, and you would say, why? And your parents would respond with what? Because I said so. Right? But then when you get older and you become a parent or you become a grandparent and you realize, well, my parents weren't saying because I said so, just because they wanted to be mean and bossy. There was real reasons behind what they were doing. It was for my benefit to either protect me or keep me out of a situation. It was for my own good, but as a small child, I wouldn't be able to understand those explanations. God has certain laws, certain ways of going about things that's for your own good and for his glory. And he doesn't have to explain it to you or reason it out to you. In many cases, you wouldn't be able to comprehend it. That's kind of how I view some of the things going on. 
also, when God struck down Uzzah, it caused fear in David. So now he knows, okay, I got to take this situation seriously. And in the future, they do it the right way. They bring it in by the poles and God blesses it, right? Another similar story that we'll just mention quickly. So here, and then I'm going to show you another story. So I'm sorry, we've got to, I'm really breaking this down today and I hope that's okay. After they die, Moses calls to Mishael and Altsaphan and the sons of Yisiel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the Kodesh place, the holy place, out of the camp. So they came there and they t basically he told them, Go in there and take the bodies out of here. And then we're just going to go about our business. <laughs> what came to mind was what we studied recently in our study in the book of Acts. And so let me pull that up for you just real quick. Um, it's actually Acts chapter 5. I'm just trying to get... Uh, here we go. Acts chapter 5, when we have Ananias and Sapphira. Okay? The story is, is they, so, they sold their property, which is a good thing, to give some of the money to the church. And a, that's a good, godly, righteous thing. But they make an error. The error is that they were being a little deceitful about the situation. They were acting as though before men that they were that they had sold their property and they were bringing all the funds in to give it to the church. But in reality, they were only giving a part of it, which would have been a fine had they just said it up front. But they they really kind of lied about the situation. Acts chapter five. Let me just read six verses for you. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the proceeds for himself, with his wife's full knowledge. And bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias collapsed and died. Listen, what was the end result? And great fear came over all who heard about it. Again, God's telling the early church, don't mess around with these things. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. And he uses Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, as an example. And people come in, young men come in, and they drag their bodies out. It's just like what happened here. All right, I'm almost ready to wrap up my thoughts on this. I have two more thoughts to cover, and then we'll just read the rest of the portion. Getting back to trying to understand why Nadab and Abihu would do such a thing. First of all, let's remember these weren't just like second-class citizens. They had participated in a very important event that ended with fire. That was very similar to what was going on here. They saw the glory of the Lord before. I don't know if it's coming to memory, but I'm going to show you. They participated in an event where they were kind of uh, special in the, in the situation, and the situation ended with fire. And maybe they're thinking, hey, let's go get the fire, even though God didn't command it. And that was the error that they made. It wasn't that they were ungodly. If we go to back to Exodus chapter 24, okay? So we got to go back in time a little bit. Let me read some of this. And to Moshe, he said, come up to Yehovah. So Moses is being asked to come up the mountain, but not by himself. Listen, come up to Yehovah, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. So there's the two sons. And seventy of the elders of Yisrael, and you shall bow yourself from a distance. But Moshe shall draw near to Yehovah by himself, and let them draw not near, nor the people who go up. So they got to actually go up the mountain. Moses, Aaron, and his two sons, Abihu and Nadab, and they got to see the glory of you can go read the whole chapter yourself. They got to see the glory of the Lord and you know, but then Moses eventually goes further up into the cloud where they can't see him. And so they, they have this amazing experience. 
Uh, if we go to verse 14, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we have come back and see Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has matters, let him go up with him. And Moshe went into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain and the esteem of Yehovah. That sounds familiar, right? We just read how when they finished the tabernacle and finished committing it, the esteem of Yahweh appeared before it and the people fell on their faces. Same situation. And Moses went up into the mountain and a cloud covered the mountain and the esteem of Yahweh dwelt on the Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the mist and out of the cloud and the appearance of the esteem of Yahweh was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain before the eyes of the children of Israel. And Moshe went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And it came to be that Moshe was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So there's very, it's very possible that Nadab and Abihu are making this connection, right? They're like, hey, remember when all this happened before and we saw the glory of the Lord and it ended with the, this great fire. Let's go get some strange fire. Let's go get the fire and, and bring it in. After all, we are like kind of special i mean we 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 got to go up on the mountain with moses and we've been in front of the tabernacle for the last seven days six days or whatever taking care of it and getting everything prepared let's go get the fire but god didn't command the fire and so as a result of their error just like uzzah with the ark they paid a great price let me cover one more thing I just want to read a short commentary to you. It's just one little tiny paragraph about this silence of Aaron. From Matthew Henry. Here's what he says about the silence of Aaron. The most quieting considerations under, the most quieting considerations under affliction are fetched from the word of God. What was it that God spake? Though Aaron's heart must have been filled with anguish and dismay yet with silent submission he revered the justice of the stroke when god corrects us or our sin it is our duty to accept the punishment and to say it is the lord let him do what seemeth him good whenever we worship god we come nigh unto him as spiritual priest this ought to make us very serious in all acts of devotion. It concerns us all when we come nigh to God to do every religious exercise as those who believe that God with whom we have to do is a holy God. He will take vengeance on those that profane his sacred name by trifling with him. Amen. Yeah, we just have a generation of Christians right now. And I'm hoping that it's starting to change. And I'm hoping that my work's helping it start to change. They just have really lost the fear and reverence for God. And have forgotten just how holy and set apart He is. And just how filthy we are. And we need to not be messing around when it comes to these things. We need to be taking it very, very serious. He didn't even spare the two sons of the high priest. So with that backdrop, and I'm sorry for taking so much time, but I wanted clear thinking about this situation. Let's finish off our study. I'll just pick back up with verse 3, what God had to say about what happened. The Moshe said to Aaron, This is what Yehovah spoke, saying, By those who come near to me, let me be Kodesh. Let me be holy. Let me be set apart. And before all the people, let me be esteemed. And Aaron was silent. And Moshe called to Mishael and to Elzaphan and the sons of Usael and the uncle, the uncle of Aaron and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the Kodesh place and out of the camp. So they came near and they took them by their long shirts out of the camp. And Moshe had, as Moshe had said. And Moshe said to Aaron and to Eleazar and to Ithamar, his sons, do not unbind your heads, nor tear your garments, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brothers and the house of Israel bewail the burning which Jehovah has kindled, and do not go out from the door to the tent of appointment, lest you die. For the anointing oil of Jehovah is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moshe. And Jehovah spoke to Aaron, saying, 
Do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of appointment, lest you die. A law forever throughout your generations. So as to make a distinction between the Kodesh, the holy, the set apart, and the profane, and between the unclean and the clean. Listen, God has these rules and these laws, and it's so that you can be clearly distinguished from the rest of the profane world. This is why I get so worked up about the church being so uh, capitulating to the culture's wickedness, to having this attitude, oh, we just need to be relevant to the... No, you don't need to be relevant to the culture. You're called to be set apart from the culture. You should be ridiculously different, painfully different, to the point where you might even be suffering persecution on some level because you're so not like the rest of the world. That's what the church is to be. A light on the hilltop, a salt to the earth. I'm sick of this. You can't distinguish a Christian from a complete pagan. Sorry, ranting. Uh, so as to make a distinction between the Kodesh and the profane and between the unclean and the clean, and to teach the children of Israel all the laws which Yahweh has spoken to them by the hand of Moshe. And Moshe spoke to Aaron and Eleazar and to Ithmar, his sons, who were left. Take the grain offering that is left over from the offerings made by fire to Yehovah and eat it without leaven beside the altar, for it is most Kodesh. And you shall eat it in the Kodesh place, because it is yours by law and your sons by law of the offering made by fire to Yehovah. For so I have been commanded. And the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the contribution you eat in a clean place, you and your sons and your daughters with you. For they are yours by law, and your sons by law, which are given from the slaughterings of peace offerings of the children of Israel. The thigh and the contribution and the breast and the wave offering, they bring with the offerings of fat made by fire, to bring as a wave offering before Yehovah. And it shall be yours and your sons and you as the law forever as Yehovah has commanded. And Moshe diligently looked for the goat of sin offering and saw it it was burned up and he was wroth with Eleazar and Ithmar the sons of Aaron who were left saying why have you not eaten the sin offering in a Kodesh place since it is the most Kodesh and Elohim has given it to you to bear the wickedness of the congregation to make atonement for them before Yehovah see its blood was not brought inside the Kodesh place you have eaten it without fail in a Kodesh place as I have commanded and Aaron said to Moshe, See, today they have brought their sin offering and their burnt offering before Yehovah, and these have come upon me. If I had eaten the sin offering today, would it have been right in the eyes of Yehovah? And when Moshe heard that, it was good in his eyes. Okay, last chapter, chapter 11. And Yehovah spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the living creatures which you do not eat among the beast that are on the earth. Whatever has a split hoof completely divided, chewing the cud among the beast, that you do not eat. Only these do you not eat among those that chew the cud, or those that have a split hoof, the camel, because it chews the cud, but not have a split hoof. It is unclean to you. And the rabbit, because it chews the cud, but does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the hare, because it chews the cud, and does not have a split hoof, it is unclean to you. And the pig, though it has a split hoof completely divided, yet does not chew the cud, it is unclean to you. Their flesh you do not eat, and their carcasses you do not touch, they are unclean to you. These you do not eat of all that are in the waters. Any one that has fins and scales in the waters, in the seas, or in the rivers that you do eat. But all that have not fins and scales in the seas and in the rivers and all that move in the waters or any living creature which is in the waters, they are an abomination to you. They are an abomination to you of their flesh. You do not eat and their carcasses you abominate. All that, I, the, all that have not fins or scales in the waters is an abomination to you. And these you do ab abominate among the birds. They are not eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the vulture and the black vulture. 
and the hawk and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, and the ostrich and the night hawk and the seagull and the hawk after its kind, and the little owl and the fisher owl and the great owl and the white owl and the pelican and the carrion vulture and the stork and the heron after its kind, and the hopo and the bat, all flying insects that creep on all fours is abomination to you. Only those do you eat of every flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet, which to leap on the earth. These of them you do eat, the locust after its kind, and, and the destroying locust after its kind, and the cricket after its kind, and the grasshopper after its kind, but all other flying insects which have four feet is an abomination to you. And by these you were made unclean. Anyone touching the carcass of any of them is, an uncle is unclean until evening. And anyone picking up a part of a carcass of any of them has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. Every beast that has a split hoof, not completely divided, or does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcasses is unclean. And whatever goes on the paws among all the creatures that go in all fours, those are unclean to you. Anyone who touches their carcasses is unclean until evening. And he who picks up their carcasses has to wash his garments and shall be unclean until evening. They are unclean to you. And these are unclean to you among the creeping creatures that creep on the earth, the mole and the mouse and the tortoise after its kind, and the gecko and the land of the, the land crocodile and the sand reptile and the sand lizard and the chamberlain. These are unclean to you among all that creep. Anyone who touches them when they are dead becomes unclean until evening. And whatever any of them in its dead state falls upon becomes unclean, whether it is a wooden object or a garment or a skin or a sack or any object which work is done, it is put in water and it shall be unclean until evening. Then it shall be clean. Any earthen vessel into which any of them falls whatsoever is in it becomes unclean and you break it. And the food which might be eaten on which water comes becomes unclean and any drink which might be drunk becomes unclean and any whatever their carcass falls becomes unclean and oven or cooking range it is broken down. They are unclean and are unclean to you. But a fountain or a well, a collection of water, is clean. But whatever touches their carcasses is unclean. And when their carcasses falls on any planting seed which is to be sown, it is clean. But when any water is put on the seed of any part of any such carcass falls on it, it is unclean to you. And when any of the beasts which are yours for food dies, he who touches his carcasses becomes unclean until evening. And he who eats of its carcass has to wash his garments and he shall be unclean until evening. And he who picks up its carcass has to wash his garment, and shall be unclean until evening. And every creeping creature that creeps on the earth is an abomination. It is not eaten. Whatsoever crawls on the stomach, and whatsoever goes on all fours, and whatsoever has many feet among the creeping creatures that creep on the earth, these you do not eat, for they are an abomination. Do not make yourself abominable with these creeping creatures that creep. And do not make yourselves unclean with them, lest you be defiled by them. For I am Yehovah your Elohim, and you shall Kodesh yourselves. And you shall be Kodesh, for I am Kodesh. And do not defile yourselves with any creeping creature that creeps on the earth. For I am Yehovah, who is bringing you up out of the land of Mitzrayim, that is to say Egypt, to be your Elohim. And you shall be Kodesh, holy, for I am Kodesh. This is the Torah of the beast and the birds of every living creature that moves in the water and of every creature that creeps on the earth to make a distinction between the unclean and the clean and between the living creatures that is eaten and the living creatures that is not eaten. And that, my friends, is the end of the Porsche Parsha for today. Look, there's a lot of... I'm, I, I thought about going into it, but I'm not going into it. But I'll just briefly say there, there's a lot of theories out there about why God uh, set up these dietary laws and some people attach some spiritual things to it um, you know the pig it rolls around in the mud it's kind of filthy or whatever you know they got all these things and I think there's probably some truth to all of that um, 
But I also think, and I'll just say quickly and then wrap it up because we're already way over our time. Um, you know, as someone who takes exercise and diet very, very serious, um, I believe that you are what you eat, right? And the same goes for some of these things. And a lot of these uh, animals and beasts that are mentioned are extremely unhealthy to eat, like the pig, as an example. And then you have the a lot of the marine life that doesn't have fins or skin. They're bottom feeders, right? Like the, I think there's actual real health reasons why God has distinguished the food. Even Daniel was concerned about overall health. And he said, we don't want to eat this Babylonian garbage. We just, just give us vegetables because this Babylonian food that you guys are eating, it's not only is a lot of it unclean, but it's just garbage. I'm paraphrasing. And as a result, Daniel's skin and the rest of his wise men's skin was excellent. And they looked healthy and strong. And so the guy who was over them ended up making everyone eat that diet. It's known as the Daniel diet, right? So anyway, that's all I will say about that. Um, yes, I'm very aware of all the other things that people have come up with, and many of them might actually be true. Um, that's just one of my thoughts on it. So you can do what you want with that. All right, I've went on for 40 minutes, a lot of ranting. Um, I pray that you've been blessed in the powerful name of Jesus. I hope that your hearts are pierced, and I hope that you start, if you're not already, I hope that this story makes you take how you come before God in your prayer life and everything. I hope it, I hope it's pierced your hearts and maybe even put a little bit of fear and reverence into you that you approach those things seriously. That's all I have for you this morning. Peace and grace be with all of you. Until next time, God bless.